good morning. The first lesson is taken from Isaiah, and it will be 58, reading from verse 1 through 12. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion, and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my way, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is this the only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is it not the kind of fasting it is not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor and wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and to and do not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will be quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of a finger, and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfying the needs of the pet, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your need in the sun land and will strengthen your, your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken wall, restorer of the streets with dwelling. The next lesson is taken from Matthew 1 through 4, and then 16 through 18. So starting with Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you get to the meeting, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their full reward. But when you get to the meeting, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And in so doing, giving in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And moving to 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their full reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it would not be obvious to the men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Thank you, Jeff. Well, today, um, I must say it's really nice to be back in the saddle. Um, I, I don't like to be out away too much or too often. Um, I think I just broke that. Sorry. All right, there we go. I'll just put it in my pocket before I do further damage. All right. So, 
Today, I'm going to put myself out there a little bit, and it may put some of us out there a little bit as a whole and as a congregation. Uh, we're going to discuss the season of Lent, and depending on how you were brought up and what denomination you were brought up in and what religion you were brought up in, we all have a different opinion and thought process of this season. Okay, it's very important for us to understand, um, especially within the Evangelical Covenant umbrella, that there is more than just a Swedish Lutheran heritage here. There is more than just a German Lutheran, American Lutheran, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a non-denominational, and if I'm forgetting anyone else, Catholic. If I'm forgetting anyone else, please yell at me later. Um, but we are all underneath this umbrella of understanding what the season means. And as I said prior, it means something different to each and every one of us. So I will say in all humility, um, if I forget something or if I don't honor the tradition side of it as much as I should, please tell me. If I sound like I'm for it and you don't think that we should be, tell me, please, because it's very important that we talk about these things, whether we agree or don't agree. But today we're going to talk about a brief history of the season of Lent. We're going to talk about the colors, which is purple. And we're going to talk about the purpose of the season and two main viewpoints and then dabble in Scripture a little bit. So I, I apologize it's not going verse by verse through Scripture, but I think this is very important to discuss today. So, brief history, okay? I didn't know this, but the, the word for Lent comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for spring. And as we look outside, uh, we can see signs of spring all around us. Uh, Lori, is it the perennials? Perennials are the ones that come up every year because I get it confused with annuals, right? Does anyone else do that? Okay, yeah, all right, good. At least I'm not alone. But we see the perennials popping up through the ground. We see buds on the, on the trees and the bushes. Um, we see grass growing, and all I can think about is mowing at this time. All right, so that's all we can think about is seeing that green grass. When we went to Missouri, it was so neat because the shrubs and the trees, the flowering ones, were already blooming. And we saw this wonderful spring to come. And being that the word Lent comes from this word, it kind of gets us in the mind frame of new birth and annual new growth. Okay, so let's talk about three things that helps us, the season helps us to see. Number one, for those who participate and observe in the season of Lent, um, they can be used in a way to convict those who deny God and deny their sinfulness and divide, deny their Savior of that fact that they are in fact sinful and they are in need of a Savior. Number two, those who participate and um, observe Lent can be used in a way to convict professing believers that have fallen away and that, you know, don't attend church as much and fellowship with believers as much to remember their promise and to come back to the church and fellowship, not only to the church, but to God and to that promise that they've made. Number three, and I'm going to say for the faithful, this is the most important one. It's to challenge new growth within us. We are not to sit stagnant. As we look around at the grass, it's not, it would be nice if it stayed just one length and we never had to mow it, but it constantly grows. Okay, and that's what Christ demands in each and every one of us, that we are constantly growing. I'm going to go through a brief history, very brief, and I'm going to leave out every single denomination, every single religion, because the moment that we hear A or B or C, our biases and our presuppositions kick into play and we're like, oh no, can't think of that, you know? So we're going to leave that out. We must understand this is a history of Lent through the history of Christianity as a whole, uh, as a whole. So many early Christians fasted for several days in the, se in the second century, and that's before it was officially on the books. Um, so they fasted for a couple days. And the thing about their fast, it wasn't Diet Coke, it wasn't candy, it wasn't some things that we give up for Lent. Um, it was, they did without food. They did without water. They did without life-giving things. Okay, they did without, and crazy thing, some gave up their clothes and then put 
uh, burlap sacks on. Could you imagine wearing that to work all day? No. It would be itchy and it would be horrible. But that's what they did. They gave up life-giving things in order, well, not that nice clothes are life-giving, but you understand. Um, they gave this up in order to create a stronger devotion to God as they eliminated these things that made them turn to God in prayer. Okay? So, as this continued, it continued to the 4th century, which is the first documented uh, time um, of Lent, where it became a period of 40 days. Okay, so when we look at the 40 days, we can say Ash Wednesday was March 1st, and the Resurrection Sunday is April 16th. So if you take out your calendar, guess what? That's not 40 days. It's 46 days. So why all of a sudden is it a period of 40 days when it's 46? Well, in that time frame, they didn't think it was appropriate to fast on Resurrection Sunday. So they eliminated the six Sundays. So what you did was you fasted, uh, say, Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday you got to do whatever you wanted. All right? Or vice versa. All right? Don't take my loose terms of do whatever you wanted on Sunday. Yeah, don't, don't think of that way. It, mean, it meant that you got to eat, you got to drink water, you got to do whatever you gave up. Um, so, the reason why they did this, the reason why those early people fasted, is because they felt that the Easter celebration warranted a something more powerful than just a celebration. Okay? Um, I come from a non-denominational background. I come from a Presbyterian background, too, where I've seen both play out, in a sense. My family is Catholic. So I've seen Lent play out there too, and there's different motives in each one. But they thought that the power behind the Easter celebration warranted a sacrifice in the dying itself. So over the course of the next couple of centuries, um, it evolved into a time of intense training. Okay, so where uh, people who profess faith in Christ Jesus were then observed were then tested to see if the Holy Spirit was actually within them. And, and we don't do this today. It's not our place to judge. But they were tested. And then during that 40-day period, they were instructed. And I'm talking 40 days of intense training. It's talking about every sermon that I've given over the course of almost two years in 40 days. Because they taught what it, was, what it meant. What it, huh, gosh, I'll get over the stuttering. That's what happens when you get excited. Uh, it gets yeah, ahead of it. Okay, so basically what they did was is that they instructed you in every aspect of Christianity and what it means to be Christian, but not only that, they instructed you in the cost of that profession because as I've preached on many times, the cost is lost in this time frame. There's no cost to saying that we're Christians nowadays. We just say it. Okay, and then we have the little badge that says, hey, look at me, I'm Christian, whether we are or not. All right? So, what happened then, and I'm sorry, history is always boring, but it's important. Um, that period was for believer's baptism, and then infant baptism was on the rise. And because infant baptism went on the rise, there was a need for intense training. We can't intense put infants through intense training on what it's like to to be a Christian and understand the cost before they're baptized. So that kind of fell to the wayside. So then, as it evolved more and more, um, it became a, theory of, of, a season of denying self. Okay, let's put it that way. It focused more on um, denying oneself of those life-giving elements, the food, the water, uh, giving up um, extra things that we have in abundance to put ourselves in the shoes of the poor and the poverty stricken. Okay, I'll, I'll say a, a joke, and I'm sorry if there's anyone Catholic in here, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but um, it said in, in the research I was doing that some of the Catholic elements of giving up things to put themselves in the shoes of the poor has kind of lost its meaning. 
Um, so they would not eat meat on Friday, but this was okay. Okay, so what they would do was they would abstain from eating the filet mignon at the restaurant and then order the lobster tail. Okay, so that, that is what the meaning of it evolved to over time, is that it became about just giving up meat instead of understanding why we are denying ourselves. Okay? So as it's evolved from generation to generation, the domination to the... the, the, the <laughs> ah, no more time off for me. No more time off. Yeah. As it's evolved from denomination to denomination, the main emphasis has been on that physical fasting and prayer and giving. And I will say that it's important to understand that some denominations have even made it mandatory for people to observe and participate in it. Okay? It's just out there. And I will say from Scripture, that, that should not never be the case. It should never be the case that we're mandated to do something for a period of 40 days. Okay? It's not mandated in Scripture to do this. There's evidence of it, which we'll get to, but um, we'll take a look at Scripture. Colors of the season. Some of you saw green the last time, at least two weeks ago. Um, it was green and it now moves to purple, and there's a huge reason for that, because it symbolizes the pain, suffering that Christ endured, leading to and on His death on the cross. It also symbolizes the pain and suffering that is in this world because of our sin. That's what we must see every time we look to that purple sash. Well, that's not purple, but those are... Um, yeah, everyone's playing tricks on me today for some reason. Okay. All right. Another thing that we must understand about purple is that it's a color of royalty because it cost so much to make purple clothing in that time. The dyes were rare and it was very expensive. So only the kings and the royalty could have that type of clothing, which makes us remember the resurrection of our King, our Savior, Christ Jesus. So with the colors behind us, let's talk about the purpose a little bit. All right, the purpose of Lent is not to just focus on the triumph and the joy of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Okay, Lent helps us to expand, to understand the whole story, okay? As we, the confirmation kids, Dave Eckerty and I have been going through, if you go through that whole time frame leading up to the death, resurrection of Christ, it is up and down and it's powerful. It goes through times of just triumph and joy to times of just pain, sorrow, and suffering. But what we've done in the process of just focusing on Palm Sunday and Easter is that we forgot how to humble ourselves before God, and that's what Lent helps us to remember. It helps us embrace the larger story as we go through the pain of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. But it also calls us to examine our own lives with fasting, prayer, and giving. And these help us to submit ourselves before our Lord in humility, which helps us to embrace our mortality, which helps us to know the extent of our sinfulness and to remember the consequences of those sins. It also helps us to remember that eternal life in heaven is not earned by our good works or the practice of our righteousness, no matter who we are trying to get to see it. It also remi reminds us that eternal life in heaven is not available for purpose. Okay? It helps us to see Jesus Christ as the only way to God in heaven. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we must remember that in this 40 days. It helps us to see Jesus Christ as the only way to God in heaven. It helps us to see the need for the Savior, Jesus Christ, and to take care of that sin that stands opposed between that holy God and us. Christ alone wipes that out. Christ alone atones it. Which helps us to lay our false pride down. Our external actions that we may have been taught since the point of birth all the way up till now on how to replicate a faith. We must be willing to lay that down. Because it falls completely short. 
without faith. Isaiah 58 talks about the people who are replicating the faith that they've been taught, but their heart wasn't in it. This has caused us to plead to God for Him to, number one, thirst us, to know us, to test us, to know our thoughts, and to see if there's any wickedness in us, and ask for Him to remove it. All of this should help us to see the mission of the church in this time. Okay, all of this. Our mission, church, as ambassadors of Christ during these 40 days, but I'm not going to say 40 days, every day, every day, is to proclaim the death of Christ Jesus as the only atonement of sin. It's to remember the death of Christ as the only atonement of sin and respond in gratitude and genuine and sincere faith. That is our purpose. That is our mission. But unfortunately, the season of Lent has evolved in some cases. And I'm not picking on anybody in this. Okay? It's here. It's here where it has evolved. It's become a formality in some denominations where we display our faith for God and man to take notice of. I can say we as Christians are fasting for the wrong reasons. We as Christians are praying for the wrong reasons. We as, as Christians are giving to the poor for the wrong reasons. We're not looking to be renewed by God. We're not looking for spiritual heal, healing by Him. We do not seek His security in this life through His righteousness. We do not seek God's glory in the life to come. We do not desire a free-flowing relationship with the Lord, a relationship where we desperately seek Him with all of our heart and all of our soul, a relationship where God will say to us in our time of need, I am with you. I am with you. We seek to force God to respond to our acts of righteousness like He's in a bottle that we can rub and say, Hey, blessing. Come on. Right? Or we hold the sign up. Right? That says, we'll give blessing. But there's a disclaimer. No prior or current devotion to me needed. That's what we think he is. And this is why there's two viewpoints on Lent. And please forgive me, no matter which side of the fence you are on this one. The two main viewpoints. The season of Lent should be openly observed and practiced by all Christians. The purpose is to gain favor with God. The other viewpoint is that the season of Lent should be a part of the practice of the church and has no value, or should not be a part of the practice of the church and has no value to Christians. God, that's pretty extreme, right? One over here, one over here. But I have to say as believers, as Christians, it has to be somewhere in the middle. It has to be. Okay? Which is here. In our heart. It's the motive in which we do these 40 days. It's the motive in which we fast. It's the motive in which we give. It's the motive in which we pray. If we look to Isaiah 58, the people were replicating this faith, showing them, Lord, do you see me? People, do you see how close I am to God because of how I'm acting, how I'm praying, how I'm giving to the poor? But... Matthew chapter 6 blows that up a bit and says, be careful. Be careful of how we practice our righteousness before men. And it, it reveals the hypocrisy in people who pray to be noticed on the street corner. Okay? The hypocrisy for those who fast in a way that, oh, look at me, woe is me, I'm down. Well, we'll get sympathy and we'll be seen as the heir apparent of Christ Jesus by our actions. There's also hypocrisy in the way that we expect God to act when we give. It's amazing when we give to people, there's a part in us that just cries out and says, Gosh, I hope someone saw me. Gosh, I hope someone saw me. So I get the glory, not God. And you know what? And people flesh every time expect the balloons to come down from heaven and the trumpets to blare and the red carpet to be strung up. I gave to the needy. 
God. Isaiah 58, which I hope you understand both Isaiah 58 and Matthew 6, I'm stating. I'm trying not to dive too deep into it today because we will hit it again as we go further on in our current sermon series. But we must understand Isaiah 58 lays out a fast. It lays out um, a Sabbath fast um, with prayer and almsgiving that is to be done from the heart and soul. And it will always be sincere and will always be genuine and always done with the motive of seeking relationship with God and devotion to Him instead of calling God to action, instead of calling God to notice. I will say that authentic and true worship of God is more than reading or hearing Scripture corporately or in our homes. True worship of God is more than obedience to ceremonial traditions, religious law. True worship of God is more than praying daily or multiple times daily. It's more than just giving up a Diet Coke for 40 days or candy or food and water. It's more than this. It's more than just giving to the needy. God only cares and takes notice when we are genuine in all these things. So I will say, in these 40 days, which we're currently in this season, I'm going to ask this body to search your heart, search your motive in why you are giving up what you have, or why you are giving what you have given. Our righteousness as individuals in one body must have two purposes. Number one, to glorify God. Number one. And number two, to reveal the Lord to us because He never leaves us. God never leaves us. So, in the season of Lent, please check your heart. Check your motives. And let's glorify God together in these 40 days. But not these, just these 40 days. Let's do it every day. That's the challenge for this body. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Uh, Lord, we come together as a body uh, where we've discussed the season of Lent, Lord. Um, Lord, whether man instituted or divinely instituted, I can tell you, Lord, that its purpose is to glorify you. Lord, instruct us, teach us, no matter if we have deep roots in these 40 days or not, to see it as a time where we can remember the atonement of sin through Christ Jesus on that cross. Where we can proclaim it to others and where we can respond in genuine and authentic faith, Lord. A faith that we don't replicate for honor and for praise, but a faith that's between us and you. A faith that we don't do or enact for your blessing. We do it because we love you. Lord, change our hearts. Change our perceptions of everything that we do, Lord, if it's not for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire His help, that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life following the commandments of God and walking from now on in His holy ways are invited to draw near with faith and to receive this holy sacrament. Come to the table not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be His true disciple. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence. Um, to summarize, 
for those who are visiting today. If you're a believer and follower in Christ, you are welcome at this table. Okay? Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, our Savior, do you be praised and honor for giving yourself shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake. Lord, you did this so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Lord, bless this bread which we together eat, and bless the cup which we together drink. Let us through this bread and cup become partakers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, let's go ahead and begin with our uh, confession of sin. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved you. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. And now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, for those who are going to serve, please come forward. serve in the name of the Lord.
This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Take and eat. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink of it. Please bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this supper shared in the Spirit with your Son Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you, even, even as in Christ you have served us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, if you would please rise, and we'll go ahead and sing our closing hymn. Thank you, everybody.